in the year 2000, the United States actually hit number two. We actually went a little bit higher than Singapore in the numbers. But since 2000, it was, it's been going down. It's five, six, and eight, and 12, and now, uh, now we're at 17. I do blame George W. Bush for that. Uh, I, I say that with full realization that, that uh, his presidential library and museum is on my campus. I drive by it every day. In fact, I had dinner with President Bush last week. It was pretty cool, actually. Um, but um, we asked him if, if he knew about the Climate Beyond Your Freedom under his administration, and he said he did. He, well, I don't know what he said. Um, um, so, so the economic freedom has been going down in the United States. I'll talk a little bit next about some of the specifics as to why. So let's look at those five areas. First line is going to, I know this is maybe hard for some people to see. The first line is government spending. And these are ratings, so when the, number, when the line goes up, that means we're getting closer to Adam Smith. So when the line goes up, that means spending is going down. Uh, these are the ratings from, from the index. So as you can see, actually, through the 80s and 90s, with the progression of lower marginal tax rates under Reagan, uh, spending constraints, restraint under, under Clinton, the ratings actually were getting better. Um, and then even in the beginning of the Bush administration with some tax cuts, things got a little bit better, but uh, somewhere in the middle of the Bush administration and continuing on to, to the current administration, the ratings have gotten uh, a, a little bit worse. The problem, though, is not really spending. Uh, and uh, Republicans and free market people like to talk about spending and taxes. We talk about that stuff way too much. That's not really the problem. It's a small problem, but not a big one. The big problem is in area two, which is that legal structure and property rights area. As you can see, in 2000, the United States had a nine out of 10. And on this, in this scale, that's about as good as you get. And now it's a seven out of 10. For you math majors or you stats majors, that's about two standard deviations of decline. It's a huge decline. To give you an indication of what's going on, there's a question from the World Economic Forum survey that I use. It asks, Simple question. It's asked that business executives, hundreds of business executives, do the survey every year and they've been doing it for decades. They ask them, in your country, how impartial are the judges? Simple question. How impartial? Can you trust the judges? In 2000, the people that filled that survey out in the United States gave us a 9 out of 10. In 2011, the last year for which I have data, 6 out of 10. If you look at other countries, you get 6 out of 10 on that score. It's countries like Uganda. Not, not countries you typically want to be on a list with. And it's not just that one, one area. Uh, we have multiple measures, and they're all going down. Something has changed in the United States. Yes, spending's gone up a little bit. We've got some deficit problems, you know, whatever, whatever. The biggest problem I see for the United States with respect to economic freedom is an erosion of property rights and the rule of law. We live in a country now, get a little political, forgive me, but we live in a country now where the President of the United States can tell Chrysler and General Motors bondholders their bond contracts aren't valid. And instead of going to bankruptcy court like you're supposed to, I used to teach bankruptcy stuff, so I know this. Instead of going to bankruptcy court, the President of the United States intervened to save his friends at the expense of the contractual people who had those bonds, those contracts with Bell and Boyd. The president intervened, intervened. But it's not just rich, rich people with bond contracts that are getting uh, their property stolen. Poor people get their property stolen every day on Interstate 40 in, in Tennessee. If you have the misfortune of being darker skinned than me and driving in a not so nice car in certain places with a few thousand dollars, probably a few thousand dollars, maybe your last paycheck, your last job, um, bank account so you carry your cash with you. You get pulled over for speeding by a cop. Cop says, hey, can I search your car? You say, sure. He finds $2,000 in your car. What do you have this much money for? He says. You know, I think this is drug money. That money belongs to the police department now. Oh, you have to prove your innocence to get it back. Without a judge or a jury, thousands of people every day, and there's about probably hundreds of people every day, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people annually are having their money stolen from them by the police departments in the name of the war on drugs. Without a judge or a jury. That's a property rights problem that's affecting a lot of people. So, and it's corrupting, I think, my opinion, it's corrupting the police departments. So, I can go on and tell stories, but let me talk about the numbers again. Uh, the one area of the index that isn't getting any worse is the money area. 
I forget how many quantitative easings we're up to in the Federal Reserve uh, now. Uh, some of us are waiting for the for this axe to fall. So far, the inflation problem is not rearing its ugly head in the United States. Uh, I fully expect that the next time I give this talk at the University of Illinois, when they invite me to come back, uh, that, that, that line will also have taken a, a bit of a, a dive, but we'll, we'll wait and see when the numbers come in. The area four, which is that gray line, that's the trade area. We've also been going on a protectionist bench. Tariffs and quotas are up, and capital controls are up, and a number of different measures we have for how easy it is to cross borders, both human beings to cross borders, but also goods and services to cross borders. But those things, that's gotten harder. There's less freedom to travel and, and to, to move goods across the border. And then lastly, the regulatory area, the green line, that's also gone down modestly. But as you can see, it's really that property rights number, the blue line, that's gone down the most. So that's the United States, and that's the bad news. I really do prefer to give this talk. I've talked to a party, because it's helpful to have a drink in your hand. Uh, and put these, these bad numbers up there on the board. All right, let me talk about some other countries and uh, tell you why, why all this stuff matters. Here are just some of the other larger countries. We rate 152 countries. So I, I can't show them all to you. It would be way too small for us to, to, to read the words. But here are some of the larger countries. The, uh, you can see the United States again is up there at 7th, Germany at 19th, France, Turkey, some of the uh, Russia, Brazil. The color codings are indicating quartiles. So the blue is the top, 20. if you're blue, you're in the top 25%. If you're green, you're in the second 25%. Yellow is the third, and red is the last, the bottom grouping. So the colors are trying to give you sort of an idea of where they are percentile rank wise. I get a lot of questions about India. As you can see, India is red. It's actually right on the border of, of, of yellow and red. It's right about that 75th percentile um, score. Uh, China is obviously reformed a lot. The economic growth in China has been the fastest in the world, 9 10% growth rates uh, for you know two decades. And the progress in China is, is, is impressive. But let's not, uh, let's not call China a free market economy, folks. Let's be honest here. Uh, I'll give you one, one sort of talking point on this. Uh, the entire banking system in China is owned by the government. So literally everybody in China, every, every domestic person anyway, who wants to start a business, expand a business, or anything like that, has to go to a government official to get a loan. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of free market capitalism, I don't think about having to go to a government official to get a loan. So a lot of liberalization has occurred in China, and it's, it's impressive, it's laudable, it's good, but uh, it's certainly, China has got a long, long way to go before we put them into the category of even like Western market economies, like Western Europe, or whatever. They have a long way to go to reform. Same can be said, I think, of India, Brazil, um, so on. Uh, Venezuela is at last. They've been uh, they've been just doing everything they can to keep that last position. They now are lower than Zimbabwe. <laughs> Here's a map that we actually put on the cover of the book, and and this has all the countries that we rate. You see, we don't rate all the countries. The great countries are the ones we don't have enough data for. So we don't rate Cuba or North Korea. Although I'm pretty sure I know where Cuba and North Korea belong. Uh, we also don't rate Sudan and Libya, but we've gotten most of the countries now that are, that are important. And again, the color codings, blues are the top group, greens the second, and so on. There's some neat patterns there. I love the Chile and Argentina contrast. That's kind of fun. Um, I love looking at the old Soviet Union. Now, this is uh, the most recent data, but you, can, you, you certainly know that that whole, so, that whole Soviet Union up there, that entire area of the old Soviet Union, uh, that would have been in 1980, if we were looking at 1980, that would have all been red, right? That would be the worst, as far away from Adam Smith as you could get, right, the Soviet Union. And since the break of the Soviet Union some 22, three years ago, we've seen just a massive sort of spread of, of stories going on. You see, if you look closely, you'll see a uh, little tiny Estonia right there. Estonia is a blue country. They're in the top uh, 15, I think they're in 12 or something right now. Uh, my favorite country in, in the whole world, I guess, except for my own, is that one right there. Does anybody know where that, that little point, that little blue? Anybody know where that is? Geography quiz. Yeah. Georgia. That's the country of Georgia. I, I just got back from there. I've been there a, a dozen times. And uh, I, I know a lot about it. And, and again, 23 years ago, that was the Soviet Socialist Republic of Georgia. Uh, one of the most tightly controlled economies that's ever existed. And the span, mostly in the last 10 years, they've liberalized to the point that they're now just into the blue area, they're ranked, I think, 28th or 27th in the whole world. 
you know, an absolutely amazing transformation of, of that, that economic system. Georgia's economy, I might add, is doing quite well, 68% growth rates for the last decade. Uh, still a very poor country, but the growth rates have been impressive. And if you've been to Georgia, as I have over the years, you can actually see progress. It's quite impressive. So that's kind of cool. The other area is, of course, Africa. Africa doesn't look very good. Um, to a certain extent, this is deceiving because, you know, the, the way we construct the map is always a bottom 25%, right? There's always going to be a bottom quarter. And what you don't really see in this picture is that a lot of the ratings, the numbers themselves, are getting better for Africa. Um, and so, generally speaking, the ratings are getting better. Generally speaking, we move towards economic liberalization and economic freedom in the world, but especially so in Africa. Now, to be sure, many of them are still very low, but there's been a movement up. And especially in Anglophone Africa, English speaking, former English colonies, Ghana, Zambia, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, Kenya, Botswana, certainly, uh, also South Africa. Uh, those countries are, have moved up quite well on the economic freedom index. And I actually, this is not investment advice, but I actually do think that some of these African countries have the potential to sort of take off economically, sort of like the South and South and Southeast Asian nations did in the 80s and 90s. Um, I think that, that, that that's where we might see some really take off experiences. Uh, Francophone Africa, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, don't go there. Uh, not, not, don't invest there. That is investment advice. Don't invest in Cameroon. Uh, the, the, the French, French, Francophone African countries are, are really, uh, really lagging behind. It's the tale of two cities, uh, literally, it's a great metaphor for that, too. So. Um, okay, so that's the map. If there's any questions, you know, when we, if we do any questions here, we'll be, if you want to know about a specific country, I can do my best to give you an idea of where they are, what the whole story is. I, I don't know a lot about anything. I know a little bit about a lot of countries, so, um, but I don't know a lot of details, of course, it's too many countries. Let me tell you why all this matters, and this may be a little small, and I apologize for that, but you can certainly see the pattern from wherever you're sitting. This is a graph that correlates the level of income in each country by those four quartile groups. The blue countries are the top quarter again, and then green and yellow and red, and you can see this is average income per person, measured in purchasing power parity in terms of adjusting for inflation, adjusting for population. Uh, the average income in the blue countries on the map is $36,000. The average in the red countries is $4,000, about, about a one to seven ratio, a uh, huge difference. This is a low tech uh, picture. If you're an econometric student, I can do the scattered gram with a fancy regression line and you get the same, the same, same basic story, uh, trust me. The next one is, is economic growth. Uh, uh, you can see the same pattern. So the first graph is the level of income. The second graph is the rate of change in income. So not only are the blue countries richer than the green ones, the green ones richer than the yellow ones, and the yellow ones richer than the, the uh, red ones, they are also prospectively growing more quickly. And that's interesting because you, if you think about it, remember some of those countries that are growing rapidly, like India and China, are in the bottom group. So despite the fact that some of the, the fastest growing countries are in the in the yellows, uh, the blues are still on average outperforming some of those fast growing economies. That picture looks like the first one, doesn't it? If you read closely, though, that's not the average income for the population. That's the average income for the bottom 10% of the population. I love this chart. Actually, I, I think I'm the only one. I, I, I think I'm the only one to create. You have to do some math to figure this out. And I'm really proud of, of telling this story. Economic freedom is, I think, as much about poor people as it is rich people. And too many people think, well, economic freedom is good for rich. It's all about the rich. Man. The rich, people, rich people like economic freedom. The rich people like low taxes. The rich people like low regulations. It's the rich people think, personally. Actually, I think that rich people have less to say here. It's poor people that have less to say. So that's the average income of the poorest 10% in each of those, those four categories. In the blue countries, about $10,000 is the average income for someone in the bottom one-tenth of the population in those blue countries. $10,000 isn't, isn't a lot. I'd rather have uh, more. I do have more. Uh, but $10,000 is a lot better than $932, which is the average income for someone at the bottom of the distribution in one of those red countries. That is order of magnitude difference. I think the story matters a lot more for poor people than it does 
where is people to find all over the world? It's poor people that need economic freedom the most. And the last chart I'll show you, I have a whole bunch of these, but I'm only going to show you four of them. The last chart is life expectancy for birth. The nice thing about life expectancy data is that it is, uh, first of all, it's widely available. All countries have it. Most countries, no matter how poor, how bad the statistics are, they manage to keep track of when you're born and when you die. And the democracies do a pretty good job of calculating life expectancy on that basis. And so as you can see here, the blue countries, the average life expectancy is approximately 80 years, and the red countries is approximately 60 years. That's a big difference. It's a big difference that goes beyond how many cars you have or how big your house is. If you look to be 80 years old, there are some older folks up here in the front. There's a weird distribution of seating here. Everybody old is in the front, and young is in the back. No offense. <laughs> when we came in late, you guys stuck sitting up here with the old people. <laughs> but um, the old people, you know, if you live to be 80, you get to see your grandkids born. You get to see your grandkids grow up. You get to see your grandkids probably get married and have their own kids. My daughter, she's 18, uh, she's a freshman at SMU. Um, she has a close relationship to her great grandparents. That is a terribly special thing that most human beings throughout the history of our species have never had. I've told, I'm, 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 my daughter's 18, and I'm told by my grandparents that's really cool. That's one of the greatest things that can happen to a person is to become a grandparent. The sad reality is many people live in countries where their economic freedom is so low, and as a consequence, their income levels are so low, that they don't live long enough to experience the great joy that grandchildren are. So yeah, I, I want people to live in big houses and have cars and nice clothes and all the things that we think of when we think about development. But I also want them to know their grandkids, their potentially their great grandkids. To me, that's a story, a human story that is, is more important than GDP per capita. All right, one last thing. I'm gonna pick on and I'll do this quickly. That's a picture from 1964. I know you can't see it, but trust me, there's two lines on that, one, well, two sets of lines. One corresponds to the United States, one corresponds to the Soviet Union. This is from a textbook, an economics textbook. The textbook author who drew this picture in 1964 taught his students and taught an entire generation of students that the United States was going to grow slower than the Soviet Union. You look at those lines, the Soviet Union is going to grow faster, so the U.S. is going to grow slower. At some point in the future, roughly in this picture, roughly around 1990, the Soviet Union would become richer than the United States. That is spectacularly wrong, of course. That is one of the worst predictions that anybody has ever made in the history of making predictions. <laughs> the person who made that prediction, however, was really smart. His name is Paul Samuelson. He got the Nobel Prize, professor at MIT. He had that picture in his textbook for 10 editions. Paul Samuelson thought central planning would outperform economic freedom. And he taught his students that. And he was wrong. We now know he was wrong. And the reason we know he was wrong is because we have data. We're not making an ideological argument here. We're making an empirical argument. And to sort of wrap up, come back where I started, to me, it's so much more effective when we have disagreements and discussions with each other about how the world is, how the world should be, to have those discussions firmly grounded in data and evidence. Yes, we all have our biases, we all have our ideologies, we all have our theories of how the world works. But let's not let those ideologies and theories be the sole guide to the debate. Let's act like natural sciences a little bit and use data. Just lastly, last thing, this little plug at our website. If you want to go to our website, we have the book is available for free downloading in PDF. I don't get any royalties, so nothing in for me here. Uh, you can download the book. If you're an econometric student, uh, it, or and you just like the paper data, the spreadsheet with all of the data for all the countries, all the years, all the variables is on there. It's like a 20 meg spread uh, file. But I can't email it to you, it's too big to email now. So. But that's our website called freetheworld.com. And I think, I don't know, we're going to have questions. How are we doing questions? Yeah, we got about 15 minutes for questions. Okay, I can just handle questions if there are any. I'm cool.
The question is how I account for such low inflation. Well, um, if you look at the data, the monetary base is expanded by about threefold. The Fed's balance sheet is expanded by about threefold. And but if you look at money supply, it hasn't. And so most of the money, most of that monetary base, most of that money creation is sitting in reserves. And so it's not that surprising from an accounting point of view that it hasn't hit the economy and caused any inflation. I think the great concern, of course, is uh, with all that reserve sitting out there, if the economy ever starts going again, it doesn't look like it's, it's really going to take off anytime soon. But if it does, if that money does get released, um, yeah, it could be inflationary. It could be, I'm kind of old school. Uh, I, I kind of believe in the quantity theory of money. And uh, the, it's hard for me to believe that in the very long run, we can triple the monetary base without seeing inflation. But uh, I, don't think, I, I do believe the official data. I'm not a conspiracy guy. I, I, uh, there are people out there saying, well, there's really inflation. They're just hiding it. I don't, I don't buy that. I, uh, I think the official data are probably pretty accurate. It's just that we have this sort of overhanging risk. But we'll see what happens, if it happens. <laughs> well, what are the main arguments made by the liberals against the Europeans? Well, actually, the, the index has gotten quite a lot of use by uh, ideological opponents, by leftists, if you want to use the American term, liberal, yes. Um, I think the index is, is capturing what we want it to capture. We want it to be an index of the economic freedom. The countries that are high, like Hong Kong, they agree are more economically free. They don't like it. So, I, so I, I don't get criticisms about the numbers per se. The only criticism we get, I, and I think the most uh, worthwhile one, is um, I had a few, few uh, sort of temperate liberals, American term liberals. I use, you're using all these liberal and corrupt American sense. Uh, I usually use it in the proper sense. But uh, the, uh, some liberals have said, well, Economic freedom is good, but we need to soften the edges of it. So maybe maybe a nine isn't better than an eight. Maybe the optimum economic freedom is eight, not nine. Or maybe it's seven point two and not or whatever. Okay, maybe there's a, a, a in terms of the optimum amount. Uh, I'm, I'm and that's a potentially valid argument. Um, I don't think it's actually going to hold up to empirical scrutiny. There's very little. If you look at the data, there's very little evidence that that. That anything but higher numbers is better than lower numbers, but I'll take that as a potential criticism. I would say, however, that when someone tells me that they think there's an optimal economic freedom, it's usually right around where a sweep happens to be. <laughs> uh, <laughs>